And with that, without further ado, I'd like to introduce my glamorous assistant, um, Richard Beckett. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Tim. After tonight's presentations, there will be an opportunity for you to learn spoon bending. Yes. Yay! Yes! yes. Woo! It's the only reason our international guests are here, by the way, is <laughs> to learn spoon bending. And um, I recently did this on, on what, TV, uh, the 730 report. In fact, I did it about a month ago or so on the 730 report, sitting about where you are, sir. It was empty, they came and filled me right here to talk about spoon bending. Very strange. Tonight's speakers, wow, what a treat we have for you tonight. We have two powerhouses of skepticism from the United States. First up, we have a lady who needs no introduction, so we won't worry about her. But after that, <laughs> second on the bill tonight is a new friend of mine, Melanie Tracy King, over there. Hello, Melanie. Who is very interested in thinking. Thinking is power, critical thinking. And you will be absolutely entranced by what she has to say uh, second on the bill. But to kick off tonight, a friend of mine of many years standing, I think I met you in 2007. 2007, an amazing meeting. On a cruise, cruise to through the waters of Alaska with James Randi. Yep. Wow. That's where we wow. first, I first wow. met Susan. And she had dark hair then. She had dark hair. So did I. <laughs> <laughs> And I, it's been my uh, uh, honor to know Susan for many years. She is, we call her, I, you probably know this, it's no secret, but in the skeptical circle, she's known as the energizer bunny of skepticism. <laughs> she really is, she's a, a, a one woman tornado, cyclone, all wrapped into one. She's infamous around the world. The psychics hate her with a passion, that's why we love her. Ladies and gentlemen, Susan Gobert. <laughs> People here have seen me give a talk this year. Oh my gosh! Yeah, and how many people have seen me give talks in total? Because this is my third visit to all. I'll wow! Thank you guys so much for coming out. Okay, so, so for you and for Melanie and for Anthony, who I have been touring with the last two weeks now, since New Zealand, um, I wrote a brand new talk, and I did this the other day and I've not practiced it except once just for timing. So if you hate it, blame them. No, I just didn't want to do the same thing that I've been doing over and over again. So for you guys who've seen my talks, I wanted to do something a little more special. This is a little more personal and hopefully I'll be able to do this. What did you just do with my notes? Did I just take them and put them in my pocket? Oh, I hear them in my pocket. They're right behind you. Oh, oh I put them on the table. Okay, so I do have some notes. If I have to refer to them, it's because it's the first and possibly the only time I'm gonna give this talk. Okay, so I am known for lots of different kinds of projects. I have a project that deals with psychics. We call them grief vampires. And I go after the ones that are the little more notable ones. And I have a, a very interesting YouTube channel called Psychics Explain. I hope you guys will come and watch my videos. Um, and I also do other things concerning facilitated communication. That's also an interest of mine. I have lots and lots of interests. I work with the Center for Inquiry over there in the United States to help get the groups back together again. They call me the ambassador, whatever that is. And I also run this very powerful Wikipedia project. And we've been doing this for about, since about 2012, I think is our first entry. And it was something that I created because I watched a presentation um, about Wikipedia and how important Wikipedia is. It's the skeptics, um, you know, it's, it's run by skeptics, it's managed by skeptics. They don't call themselves skeptics, but they are. Because it's all about knowledge and getting good quality knowledge onto Wikipedia. So um, this Wikipedia project that I run, we call it the Girl of Skeptics on Wikipedia. This is our logo. Please get a sticker from me before you leave because I haven't hardly hand got any stickers at all. I feel very sad about them with me. Um, this Wikipedia project is something that we, um, hmm, how should I say this? We're trying to change all Wikipedia pages in all languages to reflect good science, 
good um, references to make them readable with great images on them. And we're trying to do this on all things concerning science of any kind. Um, and on pages concerning the paranormal and all pages concerning people of science. And we're trying to do this, as I said, in languages outside of English as well. 45% of all the work we do are in languages outside of English. Now, I will talk a little bit more about it in a minute, but what I wanna do is, this is, this, I'm leaving in a couple days. I'm going back home to the United States and Melanie and Anthony will still be here. And you guys can approach me afterwards. I'm, I'm friendly, you can contact me on Facebook or whatever, but um, if you have questions. So what I'm gonna do, here we go, let's see. I remember where I was going to start. So I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you two stories, actually, but they connect together. And it's a story you might think you know, but you really don't know, I'm sure. And I'll ask you about that in a minute. So one of the byproducts of the Wikipedia project that I run is because I want to, I have this grandiose idea, and I have lots of grandiose ideas, but this is one of them. I want to inspire people to go into science and activism and, and do other things in life, to inspire to do better things in life. I'm from very humble beginnings, and my parents were from extremely, extremely humble beginnings. And I think that, it's, it, that a lot of people have this image of science as being something that the elite do that the rich do, that your parents had to have had PhDs living in a tire, tower of ivory with, with um, ivy growing on it or something, you know. And I don't know if people really realize that they can go on to do more with their lives. They can, uh, they can invent things, they can write things, they can get degrees, or they can do all sorts of things. And I want children, students, to understand that. So when we write a Wikipedia page for a human being, we want to make it readable from the top to the bottom. I don't want any gossip on it, but I do want it to reflect humbler beginnings if they have them. I want to have a bit of personal um, information on there, not personal as in like gossip, but personal about their upbringing, what they're like, what they like, those kinds of things. And it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a game with Wikipedia. We can't really, they don't want it to be a website, because it's not a website. We don't want it to be a CV, which is like a resume. So somewhere in between the middle, and it's kind of a, a game of, uh, is this okay, is that not okay, can we add this, can we not add this? So that's what I'm gonna talk about. So how many people here have looked at the Wikipedia page for the city or, the, or some location that you grew up in? Yeah, okay, that's a good number. That's about 10 people for people watching on the video, 10 out of the 35 or so that are here. So most places have Wikipedia pages. Uh, Melanie was just telling me when we were traveling, she says, I don't think my little town of 400 people or whatever has a Wikipedia page. She looked it up and sure enough, there's a Wikipedia page for her town. And so it's a hit or miss. Some places don't have very good pages, some people do. But what I want, is I want that student or that person who's curious to be able to go to their hometown's Wikipedia page and at the very bottom of it, see that somebody has uh, is a notable person on that page. You guys have seen that before? At the bottom of the Wikipedia page, sometimes it says like a notable, notable residence or something like that. And then it gives a little link to the person and then it has a little description of who they are. And you can click on it and I hope that it'll go to a really nicely written Wikipedia page. So I think that that would be a way of giving back to our community and getting students interested in saying, oh my gosh, there's somebody famous from my town and they're not a football player or a, you know, or a, a cricket player or something like that, but there's somebody who's done something relevant. No, I'm only kidding. For all your sports fans. I'm not a sports fan, sorry. I think the superstars are the scientists and the people behind, you know, those things. Ah, the football players, whatever. Okay, so here's one just by chance. Okay, Curry Curry, New South Wales. Anybody know anybody who might have been there? Uh, so, 
So if you look at the Wikipedia page for this town that's as of 2016 only had 6,000 people in it, so that's pretty small. But if you look down at the bottom, they've had quite a few alumni. Uh, look at all those notable people in there. There's a lot. Politicians, writers, wheelchair rugby coach. Wow. Violinist, rugby football player, rugby league football player, rugby poet. New South Wales state politician, musicians, football player, oh, and, and under S, look, there's Richard Saunders. <laughs> yeah, my dear friend Richard Saunders, actor, skeptic, writer, and podcaster. So this is a little way of inspiring people that they'll be able to say to themselves, hey, I grew up in the same town as these people. Maybe I can achieve other things. You know, maybe I can. Maybe it's a little spark of, of interest. And I do this, and I. I have to use it behind my back. Same with schools. Anybody here looked up a school, not a college, but like a high school, whatever you guys call. One, two, three, four, five, okay, six, wait, seven. So these are like the same thing for your school. So if you've got a student who's who looks at the Wikipedia page for their high school, secondary school, whatever, not necessarily college, because they're gonna have a lot of notable people in most colleges. And they take a glance at it, they get this idea of looking. And here's the Riverdale Kingsbury Academy. It's a place in Brooklyn, the, uh, the Bronx. It has about 1,500 students a year. And it is um, not necessarily a, I don't know if it's a magnet score or anything like that. Anybody take a guess of who might be at the bottom of this page and the notable? It's not Richard Saunders. <laughs> this is in the United States of America. So the students who went to Riverdale Kingsbury or are currently members are you know going to school there, they might be surprised to find out that Neil deGrasse Tyson went to their school. And think about how that would feel as a student. They would see that, I added this like three days ago, <laughs> by the way. So um, as a student to look at your high school and say, oh my gosh, Neil deGrasse Tyson went to my high school, that's awesome and maybe they will feel to themselves that they can achieve more maybe they won't be an astrophysicist or the sexiest astrophysicist or, you know whatever he always uses that he, he talks about that but it's it's a it's a way of just saying to the students go for it you know there's more to you know a lot of students say well i'm from a small town nothing ever happens here you know nothing will ever happen here and i'm just going to be stuck here no there's other things you can do. And there's nothing wrong with being stuck in a town. I've been born and raised, and I still live in the same town. So I love it there. It's Salinas, California. OK, so there's no depressed All right, I call this, and I make up a lot of stuff. <laughs> this is not an idea. And I try to make it so that it's simple for people to understand. I call this finding breadcrumbs, leaving breadcrumbs. And you guys remember the old Hansel and Gretel story, they're getting lost in the forest and the kids putting their breadcrumbs in so that they it potentially will be able to follow the breadcrumbs out and get out of the situation. I don't know what happens if there's birds or animals eating the breadcrumbs as they put them out, but whatever, okay. So in the story, it works out well. I call it leaving breadcrumbs because what we want to do is we want to have people find a Wikipedia page of interest, something popular, and then we try to write all those blue hyperlinks, we try to write good Wikipedia pages that will lead a person from here to this page, to this page, and then the next thing you know, you're, uh, we're looking up something on coffee beans, and you know, you never know where you end up at. So, all right, so here's the story I'm gonna tell you. Anybody know what this is? Oh, behind my back. Anybody have any ideas what that is? How it's going? Hmm? How it's going? It's a, no. Huh? Guesses. Come on, you guys. Y'all live through this. Elon Musk. No, not Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> 19, 1993, I think. I 1990, 1995. Thank you. Hellbop. You guys remember Hellbop? Yep. Okay, you had it here in Australia, right? Okay. So, Hellbop. Now, have you thought about Help Off? Anybody ever looked at this Wikipedia page? Okay. So the thing about that you've heard of Help Off, right? The Help Off comment, right? Some very notorious bad things happened with the Help Off comment. And here's where I have to get to my notes. Um, so I don't know if you've ever speculated or thought about what is Help Off and why is it named Help Off and not Bop Hell or, or, or Biddly Bop Bop. <laughs> There's got to be a reason. 
Well, it's named for two people who found it. They, in, they didn't invent it, they discovered it. So I'm gonna be talking about these two men. There's a common help off, it's got a massive Wikipedia page, it's really nice. You know, these, uh, a lot of these astronomy nerds really get into all the details. So if you want to read a page that's super long, that's the common help off. But I'm going to be talking about Alan Hill and Thomas Bach. So Alan Hill, I don't, it has the word astronomer after that. And the reason why it has to have the word astronomer, astronomer after it, does anybody know why? Yeah, there's an actor. Does anybody know who Alan Hill is? Skipper from Gilligan's Island. Yeah. So. That was Alan Hill Jr. Oh, well, excuse me, Mr. Trivia. Okay, that's Alan Hill Jr. Well, I'm sure Alan Hill Sr. didn't have the uh, Wikipedia page. So Alan Hill, the skipper from Gilligan's Island, would have a Wikipedia page. So Alan Hill, the astronomer, has this Wikipedia page, and um, Alan Hill is, uh, I was gonna, let me see, okay, don't look, don't look. I can't remember what's next. Okay, no, okay, okay, so here's my screen. Like I said, I haven't practiced this too much. I just wrote it like two days ago, okay. So Alan Hill, I'm just gonna give you a quick biography, don't read the screen, I know you can. See, that's nice and crisp, nice projector. So he was born in 1958, he was born in Japan. His father was in the Air Force. Uh, he moved to New Mexico, it's the United States, and he says, he credits his father with giving him library books on astronomy. He credits the U.S. space program. He credits clear skies in New Mexico. And he credits Star Trek for his interest in astronomy. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people got their interest in astronomy from uh, Star Trek. I, that, that was a very powerful thing in the 1960s and 1970s. He also loved dinosaurs. And he knew every dinosaur drove his father and mother crazy. Uh, he served in the U.S. Navy. He took, got a degree in physics. He's got a Ph.D. in astronomy. And then two years before Hell Bob was discovered in 1993, he founded a group of people that goes out into the woods with, not the woods, but out into the, takes yeah. kids out, like school groups. Desert. Hmm? Out into the desert. The desert, thank you, yeah, not, yeah. So he takes them out into the desert and shows them the, the night sky. So this guy is, that's who this guy is. Now here's Thomas Bopp. Thomas Bopp. All right, so here's Thomas Bopp. He is born in 1949. Um, he has died. He died in, I think, 2018, yeah. His father introduced him to astronomy on the front porch while watching a meteor shower. He taught him about planets, and when he was 10 years old, he was given a, a telescope. It was a really small you know, 10 year old type telescope, nothing fancy, but he got a telescope and he was fascinated by the night sky. He later joined the Air Force, moved to the Philippines, then moved to Arizona and married a woman named Charlotte and had a daughter named April. He got a business degree. He took astronomy classes in like night school as elective classes for, he joined a club and then he worked, he worked in a parts department in a construction company. So these are people that have a history it's, it's, um, it's not the dry uh, Wikipedia page that people would read if it was a resume. These are, they tell a story. And I know all this information because it's on the Wikipedia page. I'm just paraphrasing it for you. But if you were to read the Wikipedia pages, you would be able to sum it up just like I just did. So what happens, oops. Okay, here's Alan Hill. I wanted to point out that this is the only photo we have of him that we can get. And it was taken by a friend of ours who's also, like Melanie a, and Richard actually, a fellow, oh, Tim, you too, a fellow of uh, Center for Inquiry. So this is uh, Dave Thomas. He runs the New Mexicans for Science and Reason. And he took the picture and I begged him for, I picked, begged anybody for a picture of uh, Alan Hill because we can't upload a picture that the photographer, the photographer has to upload it. We just can't take a picture off the internet. So that's what we have and I want to thank him for doing that for us. One of the things that Alan Hill said is there's an entire generation that's come of age having never really seen the dark sky. That's really sad. Um, yeah, and Thomas Bach, there he is. Um, again, this is the only picture we have of him and it's awful and he's died. So unless I can get somebody to upload a picture that's taken a long time ago, it's very sad. So um, we really need to have better pictures. But in some cases, we have no pictures, so I'm happy to get this. 
So Thomas Bach, okay, let me see what's the next slide. Okay, well, okay, here's my point to talk about the discovery. So I'm gonna tell you briefly about the discovery of Hale Bach and what happened with them. So Hale, that's uh, uh, Alan Hale, not the skipper, he had seen a comet before, he was an astronomer. And he was out um, looking through his telescope, passing the time. And he pointed up his telescope to a dark area of the sky. The Wikipedia page says exactly where it was. That's not important right now. He noticed something fuzzy that hadn't been there the last couple weeks. So there was something fuzzy in this corner of the uh, what he was looking at. He emailed the Central Bureau, which is what they're called, and he told them, I've seen something fuzzy, it sort of looks like a comet. And then over the next few hours, they watched to see, him and his friends watched to see if it moved in the sky. And as it moved in the sky, he gave the coordinates and he emailed them back and he said, you know, I see this object in the sky. Thomas Bopp had never seen a comet before and he had gone to the desert in Arizona with his friends and they were looking, he was looking through his friend's telescope and he, they just happened to be pointing in that direction and he looked through it and they said, what's that? What's that fuzzy thing? And they said, fuzzy thing, what are you talking about? And he said, yeah, what's that fuzzy thing right there? Because he'd never seen one. And they said, it could be a comet or something. And so what they did is they pulled out these charts and they looked to see, this is 1995, remember? So he's looking through the charts and there was nothing on the charts for something that would have been there. So what he did is they just watched it for a few hours and they were trying to figure out if it moved because that's important if it's a comet. So they, he didn't have any phone, uh, cell phone coverage. Well, it's a desert and it is 1995. So he didn't have any way of reporting the comment to anybody. So when he comes into town, closer to town, he stops at a pay phone. Remember those <laughs> pay phones? Yeah. Wow, this is a long time ago. So he's driving in and what happens is he, he realized he got to the payphone, he realized he didn't have the phone number. So he gets into home and he sends a telegram. Remember that? <laughs> and the reason why he sent a telegram is because the Central Bureau's real name is Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams. That's the name of the organization. So he took it literally and sent him a telegram. Okay, so because because he was slow to get his word in, the comet is named after Hale first. Because they don't know exactly who did it first, who discovered it first, but Hale's emailed it in. So there's uh, one for technology, right? So, um, so because Hale's email got to the Central Bureau before the telegram did, it's called Hellbot and not Bob Hale. So that's kind of a little piece of trivia. Somebody can put that in some trivia game somewhere. Okay, so after the discovery, let me see what's coming up next. Oh, here's what's next, okay. So I will go back, so that's, oops, ah, Okay, here we go. So here's what happens. After the discovery of Hale Bob, so Bob goes out and he starts doing lectures all over. This is the, uh, the second guy. And he was even on Bill Nye Science Guy's show. He worked a lot with children. And he and, and Alan Hale finally met, met for the first time in 2012 in Queensland, wow. here in Australia. That's the first time they met. They were taking children out on a school trip to go out to go look at uh, eclipses. Eclipse? Yeah, eclipse. They went to took them, take them out and show these school children eclipses. I mean, this is a big deal for, for a lot of children not to have this kind of, uh, see this kind of thing. So Hale, that's the first guy, he said he had a hard time with the press. He was having, he gave one interview to the press and they got the story right, but every interview he gave after that was just, they didn't have enough science knowledge to be able to understand what he was talking about. He, he found himself just trying to give him basic science lessons, I guess. <coughs> Maybe in 1995, they didn't have a lot of um, science journalists, or if they did, they just didn't have any on his beat. So he gave a talk to USA Today, and he was joking around, but there was this rumor about there being a spacecraft that was behind the, the, the hail ball, okay? And he says, oh yeah, in a joking manner, he tells the guy, He'll meet the aliens when they land at Roswell and confront them for following his comment. So it was an offhanded comment he gave to the USA Today people, 
And the USA Today, he spent 45 minutes talking to them, and this is all they reported. <laughs> so what ends up happening is USA Today told it in a serious way, and some of you might remember what ends up happening. Does anybody that, remember? That cult looks to mass suicide. Um, right, there's a suicide cult. Got it. Very good, you got it. So this is, okay, so, so this, oh, this is what they said. Hell will go to Roswell to meet the spacecraft on the lands, okay. So this is the joke, and this is what they reported. Sorry. Okay, so I'm gonna go. To, he's gonna go to Roswell and meet the spacecraft. So they took it seriously. All right. All right. So yeah, here's Heaven's Gate, and this was awful. It was. Read the Wikipedia page. Oh my gosh, it is intense. I think there's a documentary on Heaven's Gate. It's far more worse than you guys realize. A lot of people kill themselves, and a lot of people kill themselves even years afterwards, even after the main group of cults. Uh, kill themselves. So this is Bo, I think his name is, or Peep. Or, uh, one was Bo, one was Peep. I can't remember which one he is. But Heaven's Gate believed that there was a spacecraft falling behind Hell Bob. And they said that they were going to be beamed up to the ship. And it was really awful. It was really, really awful. But these people, and you know what's really interesting, just as a side note, I watched a documentary on this, and these people were, they were so happy to do this. I mean, they died happy. I know that sounds awful and horrible, but man, they were like into it. They really believed that they were going onto a spiritual whatever, and they, uh, it, was, it was awful, I'm telling you. But it was kind of, I don't know. They died happy, I guess is the best I can say. Um, so, okay, so I, then here's what happened to Bob after Oh, this is what Hale said. He said, another victory for ignorance and superstition. He said that at the FFRF, which is Freedom From Religion Foundation rally in 97. Okay, so this is what Thomas Bach says. He tells us to National Geographic in 1997, this has been the best week of my life and the worst. And the reason for that isn't what you think. So if you read the Wikipedia page for Alan Hale and Thomas Bach, which is where I got all this information, you will see that Thomas Bach's you know, becoming famous, he was, he was um, you know, he went on to be super famous, having this famous comment named after him. At the height of the, of the, of when the Hellbop was in the sky, his brother and sister-in-law drove out to photograph it, way out in a dark area to take good pictures of the, of the comet. And as they were coming back home, their car crashed and they both died. So that's why Thomas Fox said, this is the most amazing week of my life and the worst life week of my life. So his, his sister-in-law and his brother both died in a car crash right after photographing Hellbop. So that's pretty sad. All right, so this is what the Wikipedia page for Hell, Alan Hell looked like before my team got involved. This is it from top to bottom. There is nothing much there, no photograph, it's, it summarizes it in such a way that is too simplistic. The references, there's eight references on there. It's embarrassing. It really is an embarrassing Wikipedia page for somebody who has been an advocate for science, getting children involved in science, and not only just getting the comet named after him, but just, he's one of us. He's one of our people, and we should represent these people well. We shouldn't be allowing this kind of crap. I call this a non-scrolling Wikipedia page because you can see the whole damn thing without scrolling. Another thing I made up. So this is the Wikipedia page now, and I couldn't even show you all of it. All I'm showing you is the references. There's now 35. So, so it's an amazing, beautiful Wikipedia page with everything that I just told you on it and more. And it's, it's something that hopefully a, a person would start at the beginning and just go all the way to the end and finish it and go, wow. This is a lot of information I didn't know about this person. And, you know, he's, wow, I, I mean, I'd share a beer with this guy. He seems like a nice guy, you know, an, an interesting man. And here's the Thomas Bob. This page is even smaller with four citations when we got a hold of it. And you can see the very top here. This is, this is a, we call these a flag or a tag. And this is lazy editors on Wikipedia who will go through and they put these flags on the top of articles that need improvement for various reasons. Sometimes it's this or sometimes it's that. I call it lazy because if you're gonna put a tag on it, just fix the damn thing. You know, don't don't go around tagging and telling everybody else to do your work. But that's my opinion. Um, 
I, I run a team of people who find these pages, these stubs, and we write them right. So this is where it started with, four references, at least it had a photo. And then after it was done, there's now 29. And that's, like I said, I can only show you the references because the page is so long and it's got such good quality. All right, so and you'll see down here, here is, I don't know how to pronounce that, Alamogordo High School in New Mexico. And at the very bottom, notable alum, my Alan Hill, co-discoverer of Comet Hellbot. So if a student was to look, they would see that they're, that this famous man came from their school and maybe they can achieve something themselves too someday. And I did the same thing, I did, I added these edits because I was just writing this on the fly. I added this, um, and this is the Japan, um, Tokyo, I don't know if I can say it. In Tokyo, and this is Alan Hale, he's the um, co-discoverer of Common Help Off. So if somebody was to look at the Wikipedia page for this town, he was born in, they would find that this notable person did this wonderful thing. Um, here, another one is uh, the Cheney High School for Thomas Bob. And this one had a couple other notable people. One is an NFL, that's National Football League, just don't even watch it, it's awful. And, um, <laughs> and something about a high school trophy winner, I guess it's another sportsy thing. So, um, so <laughs> the scientist came out of, this, this guy came out of this high school. But I think the kids would like this. I think a lot of kids, well, they'll probably be more interested in the football players, I don't know, but maybe there's some kids that will say, oh my gosh, my high school I went to produced Thomas Bob. And I think that's pretty cool. Let's see, I think I'm almost done, let's see. Yeah, so here's where I get to sum up. This is some, um, so this is my project. My team, before they can exit my training, which takes about four months, and yes, you must be on Facebook because our secret cabal is located in a private group on Facebook. Before they can finish their training, they have to take one of the studs that, they, that we have on our list, and Alan Hale and Thomas Bob were part of the studs, and they sat there on our to-do list for years because we've got tons of people on there. It takes somebody who looks at it and says, oh, that's interesting, I'd like to rewrite it, to rewrite the Wikipedia page, and that's what my team did. Um, if anybody know Rob Palmer, the well-known skeptic? Okay, he's the one who wrote Thomas Bob's page, and um, the other editor, I, I can't name because I don't know if they would be okay with me releasing who they are, so I, I like to keep them, them private. But you could talk about Tom. Uh, we could talk about Rob Palmer. Let's talk about him. <laughs> Anybody got any good stories? Anyway, so <laughs> he wouldn't like that at all. Oh yeah, he'd love it. Okay, so we, we as a team, we're science communicators. That's the way I look at it. We're advocating for science. We are. We are trying to make sure that if students, and we've been helping students since 2010 to plagiarize, uh, I'm sorry, to help them do their homework <laughs> since 2010. And the way I look at it is if students, they tell people don't go to Wikipedia, don't go to Wikipedia, you can't use Wikipedia, but that's crap. Of course you can use Wikipedia. Use it to start. Use it to give you a background of what the topic is, who the person is, and then go to the citations at the bottom and get an overview and then look at those citations and use those same citations we're using for whatever article they're trying to write. But it's good to have a background. So if somebody's writing a Wikipedia page on the common hill bop, now they can go and they can get some information about the two different astronomers. And I think that's powerful. So, oh yeah, I just noticed that it has my next slide over here and I just wasn't paying attention. So we like numbers, we, we are numbers people, so I, I have this here to tell you that as of the day I made this slide, or like a day ago, I updated it. Our team makes edits all the time. In fact, you know what I did in the hotel room just yesterday? Was it yesterday? What did I get here? Two days, ago. Two days ago. Who's that guy who just won that award for, for UFO things? Yeah, so if you look at his Wikipedia page today, it has a new lead. Ooh, thanks, I. So if you look at it, it has a new lead, it's newly updated, it said something about him just being somebody who reports on uh, UFOs. Well now it has a new creative lead. And if you look at the very bottom of the Wikipedia page where it has awards, he's got a bunch of awards, but there's another one now. 2023, he got the award, and I put that whole thing, thing that you say with the phosphorus, pseudocycumeter, blah, 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 it's all in there. So um, I want you to make sure to check that out. So those are the kind of edits I make and my team makes sometimes every day. And we have to have really good citations to be able to do that. But 
we don't count that in the total amount of Wikipedia pages we edit. The only thing that we, we've written 2,184 pages or rewritten studs. The only, not, only pages in that 2,184 are pages that are completely redone. So this other UFO dude, his page wouldn't be in there at all because that's just an edit that I made, a couple edits, and they're powerful and they're really fun. Um, but we do keep track of how many Wikipedia page views. Every time somebody goes to Wikipedia, clicks on a page, we can see how many. And that's how many pages times that the pages we have written, the 2,184, have been clicked on. 153,842,640 times. That's a lot of views. We made a lot of difference. Kids are writing their homework all the time about our stuff. Like I say, if they're gonna go there, let's at least give them good quality stuff that they can plagiarize. Um, so, and that number too, it's really funny because I changed that number the slide was on another screen, and I changed that number yesterday, and and it's been two days since I had that number on there, and it's already gone up 100,000 views in the two days that I wrote this slide. I thought that was really interesting. And um, this is my nonprofit, About Time Project. If you want to take a picture of this so you can go back and look it up later. I have articles of many kinds on there. We don't talk a lot about our Wikipedia stuff, is I like to keep it kind of on the down low because I don't want my my editors to be bugged by um, anti-vaxxers or creationists or we get blamed for everything. Everybody hates us. They all hate me. Um, I'm constantly getting uh, finding a blog where somebody's very politely calling me Ms. Gerbic and how much they can't stand the work we do because we're changing Wikipedia to reflect good science and uh, the astrologers and uh, medical cracks because don't like that at all. But on here you will find a lot of information about uh, the work I've done, interviews we've done, um, and uh, about our project, especially with psychics. And so that concludes my presentation. Thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>
just absolute no, no way possibly <laughs> as any kind of brain cells left would run something as impossible as this. Um, and I started it in 2010. So no, there are no groups. The training, I can't even imagine how somebody edits Wikipedia without having a mentor or a group or some kind of training. It's, it's the, the rules and the language and everything is so complicated. We don't have any. There was a group, now I should say this, let me say this because I haven't really said this publicly. There was a group back in 2014 or 2015, a paranormal group, that you know how you have a Google search on your name? And I had one on, on Gerbic, and somebody had said, we need our own Gerbic. So they had written a blog, it was one of these, I think astronomy or, or, or Rupert Sheldrick or somebody, one of those guys, they had written this article, and I get, like I said, I get mentioned quite a bit in some of these articles. They assume we've made the edit. We haven't touched the page, but they all blame us. And so what they did is they said, we need to start our own Girl of Skeptics on the Wikipedia project, and we need, to, we need to do this. So I, using a fake Facebook page, made an account, and I went onto their blog, and I said, absolutely, let's do this. Let's do it. Let's do it. So here's the blog, and then here's all these comments, and people are like, well, how would we do that? What would we do? And I said, we can do this. I'll show you. I can edit. And they're like, you can edit Wikipedia? I'm like, yes, I can edit Wikipedia. And so that's kind of where it fizzled out. It just edited, and then I waited like a couple of weeks, and I went back, and I said, what's going to happen? Are we going to start this? Come on, let's get this moving. And they're like, well, we're still working it out. We're trying to think at the room. I'm like, oh, come on, you guys. We can do this. We can counter this group. And the, and so it just completely fizzled. So for a very short time, this group did have its own group. They just didn't know. <laughs> they were never going to do anything. They keep saying nobody has. There's not even good, real um, Wikipedia editing groups. I think I'm the only team. I mean, there's some that what they do is they're already trained and they go and they try to improve the page for Sydney, Australia, or something like that. Those most of those fizzle out, but it just. It's the whole different culture on Wikipedia. But thank you for your question. I don't think I've told that story very often, or very rarely. We had someone, a past winner of our Ben Spoon Award, and on our Wikipedia page, actually on the Wikipedia page for Australian Skeptic, there's a list of Ben Spoon winners, and this person said, I'm gonna sue us if we didn't take them off. And they said, we can't. So we don't have the page. They said, it's your page for Australian Skeptics. And this was some of the senior person, very experienced, very qualified, to try and explain to them, we can't do anything about it. You know, that, that it's there, you know, we don't, own, we don't own or run the page. And uh, that was that was a very nice excuse, actually. Yeah, there's, on. there's nothing that anybody can do to force a Wikipedia editor to take anything off. You just can't. It, I mean, it's gonna be taken off, it's the wrong kind of edit, it's not done right, but it's gonna be taken off by people who are Wikipedia editors who say, oh no, you can't use that citation, or, or you've gone too far, or whatever. But you can't sue a Wikipedia attrition. You can't sue anybody. It's you guys know the Streisand effect, right? Where Barbara Streisand tried to get the the pictures taken off uh, the coastline of California, and then when she raised that, saying you got to take this out of your video of the coastline, you're showing my house, and everybody said, oh, your house is there. Let's go take a look. <laughs> and so it went global, and that's what happens with Wikipedia edits. It, we've had people. I remember there was a king of some country somewhere who was drunk driving and having affairs and doing all sorts of stuff and made the press and it got onto his Wikipedia page and he said he was going to sue and he was so upset and all it did was people had a good laugh at his expense and went and looked at the Wikipedia page and then of course since it made the press about him wanting to get taken off the Wikipedia page that got onto the Wikipedia page and made it worse so you can't there's nothing you can do I mean if it's they can try to take it edit off, and sometimes they do, but it's it's usually going to go back. If it's correct, it's going to go right back on, and that person's going to get banned. So we have very little pushback. What was the uh, the Bill Gates Expedia? Right, it was sort of like an encyclopedia, online encyclopedia. Was it Microsoft Expedia? Anyone? No. Never heard that they changed the entries about China because there was a big market for Microsoft products. What? Encarta. Thank you. Sorry, Encarta. Probably, no, yeah, it was yeah. it was it was a scandal because basically it was being influenced by the Chinese government as to what they could have on their encyclopedia. Okay, any other questions? 
I think everyone's. Oh, come on. Come on. Hard, like, What's your favorite color? <laughs> Blue oh, or black? Uh, black. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Um, we were asked whether there were other groups trying to edit Wikipedia, but of course, every the page of every um, charlatan or quack has people putting editing their page and putting up changes in their favour, usually which vary from the facts. So, is surely there's some kind of a war between the proponents of the fake news and, and the proponents of truth, like yourself? No. 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 <laughs> uh, the rules of Wikipedia are rules of skepticism. And so if somebody comes in and tries to add, uh, or most people who believe in quacks and psychics and all that, they don't really understand rules. Oh, they just okay. not, they don't get it. So they try, they come on and they say, I had a reading by that psychic and they were the most amazing person in the world. They could add that to the Wikipedia page, but usually within minutes it's removed because we can't add personal opinion like that. Who cares what the, you know what happened? So no, no, there's no organized groups. They're just not there and they don't remove our edits because, well, they just tell people don't go to Wikipedia, don't trust Wikipedia, anybody can edit Wikipedia. So if somebody's telling you, do not read the Wikipedia page about our whatever it is, that's a red flag because um, they're just trying to keep you from seeing that information. But yeah, no, no, but there's nobody. The people who remove our edits or change our edits are usually other Wikipedia's uh, members, probably more senior, who are just don't like the citation you use or they think you've gone too far or just stuff. We rarely have our stuff changed. If we do, it's spelling. Didn't somebody just have one today that saw that I talked about that other guy, that UFO guy, and they said I misspelled, I got a typo on there, and they fixed it, I hope. I put, I put Ben to Spoon Award instead of Ben to Spoon Award. It's fixed. It's fixed, there you go. That's how Wikipedia works, so other people do it. Okay, uh, Susan, a quick question about Wikipedia pages, which are about scientific facts rather than opinions about this is the best psychic in the world. I understand how that works and, and why there's a war over who puts up what. But I edited a page which was about gravity as it happens. And there was an integral cut, there was a bit of integral calculus on the page, parts of mathematics which I had to learn how to edit, and it was wrong. So I fixed it. And I put up the correct equation, there was a fraction missing. Um, and within hours, it had been changed back to the wrong one. Mm -hmm. So I had to then get in the talk page, write a long story, and say, come on guys, get someone who's a real mathematician to work this out. This is the calculation and this is the... And eventually, after some time, I managed to, managed to get my version of the equation to stick. The correct version, not your correct version. version. Not your version, but the well, correct version. Well, it was my version, but it happened to be the correct one because I did the maths. Now, the interesting thing is that in the meantime, I did a Google search and looked for places where that equation had been quoted, and experts in expert papers mm -hmm. had used the incorrect equation yeah, in about three or four places, because that's where they got it from. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come from anywhere else, it's the only place it was wrong. So how does it work? How do you, uh, who's the arbiter and how does the system work uh, for uh, pages where there is a fact of the matter and there's something which is factually incorrect on the page and then I want to go in there and fix it? Or do I have to have an argument with people? You have to have a citation. You need to either go in first and look at the talk page and say, this is incorrect for this reason. That's the best way to do it. Look at the talk page. On every Wikipedia page in the upper left-hand corner, there's a word called talk. Tab. If you click on it, it's a tab. You click on it and there's a discussion with editors and you found that eventually. But if you just go in and you make a change, nobody's, why would somebody believe that change? Nobody's gonna sit there and do the math. It has to have a citation. I wrote it, so up, it's, I wrote it up in the talk page as well. Well, you wrote about it in the talk page after you tried to make the change and nobody, no, 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 you said the they made the change first. first and then it was reverted. No, no, I, made, I wrote it up in the talk page and changed it on the page itself. I did both. At the same time? At the same time. Okay, well, somebody, it, we just can't take somebody's opinion. There's not, unless there's a mathematician looking at that page to see that it was correct and realizing it, especially if they're Googling it and finding out 
that all these other people are quoting the wrong thing. So how are you going to know? We don't have a lot of experts on Wikipedia. We're relying on notable citations. And if those notable citations don't exist, you know, what are we going to do? You don't have a citation for an equation. Not a well, there should equation. be citations for, for equations. Yeah. I've never written a Wikipedia page for an equation, but I would think there would be somewhere that it's written correctly. Right? Mm -hmm. It has to be. Yes, Anthony? I'm just going to jump in on the conversation. It, it, it actually feels like what you're saying, and, and what you're saying is that there is um, a process to Wikipedia, and that, that your example actually proves that there's a process to Wikipedia. That just, that just not anybody can get on and change it, because what if you weren't a mathematician? Yeah, what if, you what if you're a crank and you don't believe in gra yeah. gravity? Then th that's where exactly. having a citation and, and going through the process to make the change, this is why it's hard. Where you're saying what you do is difficult, and I think you just proved it. And so this is a great example of yeah. of it's hard to make changes to Wikipedia even if it's wrong. Right, even if it's wrong. Even if it's wrong, it's hard to make a change, um, and and so therefore that's why you know crazy people don't get on there and do it. So I, I find that it's really fascinating because everybody's everybody's kind of questioning like you know can't people just get on and make changes and aren't is there this war against this and, and clearly there, there can't be if if even. You had a difficult time making the correct changes. That's just fascinating. Do you know who the person was who made the change back to the incorrect one? Um, oh, it's logged on the page. There's it's just another change. editor. Just another editor. So you don't know their qualifications. Or no, and so so some of these science pages, and you'll see that these a lot of the science pages are quoting uh, because a lot of. From what I've been, I understand a lot of people in the health industry or math industry or whatever, they don't necessarily memorize these quotations anymore. They don't remember. They don't memorize these things anymore. They just rely on uh, some quick Google or whatever to get the citation, like the uh, the scientific note uh, B squared is the over squared or the, the, the you know that one the quadratic equation. I mean, why do we need to memorize that anymore? We could do a quick Google and there it is. And so they don't bother having rote memory anymore when you could just pull it up. So if it's wrong, that's a problem. But normally, a lot of the Wikipedia pages are locked once they're in great shape. So I would assume, and I don't know this for sure, if you look on a Wikipedia page in the upper right-hand column, right-hand part of the Wikipedia page, there may be a little lock, like a padlock. And that padlock will say if the page is locked, and that means Nobody can edit it unless you're a senior editor. And we do that like a Mormonism, Jesus Christ, Scientology, evolution. Those pages are as good as they're going to get. Don't change them unless you go to the talk page and you have to have a serious discussion, discussion beforehand. So a lot of pages have received a consensus. We, we're agreed. This is what it is. Don't touch it unless there's some major reason that it needs to be changed. And I would assume a lot of, a lot of pages have I would think. How long ago was this you tried to make that edit? Um, oh, eight months, I guess. Okay, eight months. No, I don't know. So it does, the Anthony's right. So there usually is somebody who's going to quickly change it because we don't know who you are. And we don't know if you're a crank. We don't know if you're making something up. And it doesn't matter what your username is. And it doesn't matter what you say. Why would we believe you? There's nobody checking. So we have to have somebody who's of notable publishing somewhere notable that would prove that edit. Okay, I think with that we might sort of end the evening. Can you please join me in thanking Susan for the company for the evening. Thank you very, very much. I think an extremely thought-provoking evening. Thank you. Um, okay, that's it for the evening. We will be back here in January, the second Thursday in January. Uh, probably for an open